at the top of your outline, I threw on there uh, the the like the tagline for this focus series, focus series 2021. Um, humans aren't brains on sticks because we are embodied creatures. How we think is shaped by the rituals and habits that structure our days. And the goal of our several different workshops today is to think about what actually is liturgy. You know, what is liturgy for? Um, how does liturgy and, and whatever we define as liturgy affect and a shape me as an individual in being human. And I think that some of the things that, that we talk about today, you know, I think many, there's gonna be overlap in, in many of our workshops, except for Dr. Garnet Hogger's workshop. I listened to about 25 or 30 minutes of that and because I don't math, I was lost. Um, if, you, if you were in that workshop and you understood it, please come and talk to me about that so I understand how math and liturgy and practice I, i'm uh yeah anyway so um i our goal today david's and my goal today is to like i'm gonna be the the head in the sky you know thinking uh, at the thirty thousand foot level about liturgy and about who we are as human beings and david is gonna like come down to the rubber meets the road and and talking about taking what I've done in theory and putting that into practice and how, why and how it matters for us in our daily lives. So um, as I, I think about really about liturgy and practice and the definition spe specifically about being human, um, the Dalai Lama and uh, Rick Warren and a number of other people I've found uh, talk about being human as as in as this quote here human we are human beings not human doings and i would say over the last decade or so we've really heard a lot about what this about how we need to separate our ac actions and our activities and our roles in the world from who our identity is and who we how we define ourselves and while i think that's a, a good and right thing to do i think it's put us in a dilemma like what does it mean for me to just be like, does that mean I just sit and I empty my brain and I, I meditate staring at my navel and I, I just be, is that how I define myself? How do I define that separately from my activities of, from being a father and a husband and even being a Christian? Like, how do I make the sense of all this? And especially when I think about how I'm developing as an individual, how do I, what do I do as a human being to provoke change in my life? And in many ways, the, like the discipline that looks at this deeply is, is philosophy and more specifically philosophical anthropology, helping us define and orient who we, who we are in being human. And so one author I've appreciated greatly who talks about this not the first author, but the one one I've I've like explored the last um, a few years is James K. A. Smith, and this book, Desiring the Kingdom, is uh, and it's actually a, a trilogy, uh, cultural liturgies. He talks about this as a, a sense of why we do Christian education or how we do education Christianly, and he lays down this this. Um, these models of what it means to be human. And I have this in your notes. You can look at this. And there he um, discusses three different models that out of modernity, we have kind of focused on humans as thinkers. And we would define that as, and you can look at the quote in your notes, as persons are defined by thinking, often allied with a sense of functional disembodiment. That is the person as thinking a thinking thing only contingently related to a body. As such, what nourishes or fuels the I of who I am is a steady diet of ideas fed somewhat intravenously into our minds through lines of propositions and information. Essentially what he's saying is that if we just get knowledge into our brains, 
if we just study harder and study harder and study harder, then ultimately we will be different. That getting the right information in our heads changes our actions. Um, this is really often based on philosophy dating all the way back to Plato, but, but really pinpointed on Descartes, who has the, who kind of coined the phrase, I think, therefore I am. You may have heard that if you've, if you've gone through any philosophy classes. It's also purported by Kant and Hegel, um, but it, it reports an objectivity and a certain knowability of absolute truth where reason and our ability to think overcomes anything, doubt, and it transforms us into correct beings. And as, I, as his quote says, as K. Smith's quote says, that it deals with humanity as a disembodied, uh, that we are disembodied from our experience and from our environment, that those things don't impact us so much as our rationality does. Rationality is really the, the way we think is the pinnacle of humanity. Um, and this, this philosophy hints at a dualism separating our experiences from our ideas and, and our thinking. Um, and it separates the material world from the world of ideas and, and, um, and it, um, um, th it kind of emphasizes thinking well. In fact, if you, in my era, we grew up with this little jingle, this thing that happened after school and in uh, in between cartoons, you may have, can you hear this? Could you hear that? Barely, okay. So when I grew up, there was this like kid series that emphasized knowledge is power and that's the philosophy behind this like if you get enough information and enough knowledge that you have the power to change yourself or to change the world the problem is that we right now we live in a world where every person nearly like like nearly every person has access to more information and more knowledge to the ability to think with all of that information more than any other time, you know, it, it, we, we should have that kind of power. And yet we still are struggling with morality, with social justice. We're still struggling with poverty. And so apparently this thinking Humans as thinking is filling our uh, some kind of box inside of our heads isn't really the best way of thinking about change and how we should think about ourselves. So James Smith continues on and talks about how we the another model that I would say the church reports and that is has been fueled by um, Protestantism and especially the reform tradition is that human to be human is to be a believer first before we are even thinkers. That there is something um, supra rational or before, before our reason that matters first. And he, he defines it this way that our primordial orientation or comportment up to the world is not as thinkers, but as believers. Beliefs, we might say, are more basic than ideas. Humans are understood not as fundamentally thinking machines, but rather as believing animals or essentially religious creatures defined by a worldview that is pre-rational or super-rational. What defines us is what we believe, the commitments and trusts that orient our being in the world. Great Christian thinkers and theologians and philosophers like Alvin Plantinga, Nicholas Wolstertorf, uh, and Christian Smith, who is a more contemporary um, philosopher, sociolo sociologist, um, Christian Smith wrote a book called Moral Believing Animals, which is one that I, I read a few years back. In fact, I read it because he, he came for one of our focus series many years ago. In fact, Manda, you may have been here when Christian Smith came to speak as a, as a focus series um, chapel speaker. Um, but in this model of humanity that we, we, uh, uh, believe things, we have a, an a essential 
um, need to have faith or to trust in um, our world and in people. And that is our first step. Uh, before we are rational beings, we are, are believing beings and that there is some kind of um, faith that um, begins our, our first action and our first attitude and defines who we are. And that if we get the right beliefs, if we understand the right truths, and especially the absolute truth about God, then that is what forms us and shapes us and helps us um, make a difference and make change in the world. And while I think both of these, the thinking, humans as thinking, and human, humans as believing, they're both good starts and, and definitions for who we are. Um, um, James K.A. Smith says that this um, nuance of humans as, as believers actually is, is just one more way of exchanging a clash of ideas and rationality as we think about ourselves and human beings as a and, and exchange that for a, a clash of beliefs. And so now we are in our world, especially we're dealing with what is, what is belief and what is believing in the right uh, religion. Um, and, and James K.A. Smith says, actually neither of these really address the human condition and who we are as human, essentially and deeply, especially as we think about how we experience change in the world and how we define ourselves in the world. Instead, he says, and he, he his three volume set um, says that we must best define ourselves as humans, as lovers. And so he would say, this isn't the, the best definition that I could pull, but it, I think it, it captures this well, that we need a non-reductionistic understanding of human persons. Because when we think of humans as thinkers or humans as believers, we essentially disembody our experiences with the world and boil our, 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 our self down to something that is more associated with the mind than it is something that associates and, and um, blends together our mind and our body and essentially our soul. So he says that we need an understanding of human persons as embodied Asian agents of desire or love. The point is to emphasize that the way we inhabit the world is not primarily as thinkers or, believe, or even believers, but as more affective, embodied creatures who make our way in the world more by feeling our way around it. And you, you, know, you get this. You can have a, a philosophical, thinking, rational attitude about something, and maybe even a very strong conviction and belief about something, and yet you cannot choose um, your heart still is drawn toward something that is a temptation in your life. For example, this time of year, uh, they, McDonald's has a shamrock shake. And I know rationally that the shamrock shake is filled with chemicals and inorganic things that are terrible for my body. I, I believe in, I, I try to work out regularly. I try to be a very healthy person. And I've got a history of, of some heart problems in my, in my family. Um, my dad, as a result of many things, was a little bit diabetic. And so I know that sugar can be, can be bad for my body. So I rationally, I know that a shamrock shake isn't good for me. And I can have a belief that, that if I am a, a person, my temple is the body, is the my body is a temple for God and for the Holy Spirit that having a shamrock shake is not the best choice for my life. But my heart says, I want a shamrock shake at this time of year. And I long desire for a shamrock shake. So there is something that that Sith Smith says that there is a deeper definition of who we are as human beings that supersedes believing and thinking. And it, it, there is something about a loving or a desiring that we are as humans that, can, that really forms us and shapes us and drives us in our decision-making and in the way that we define who we are as human beings. 
In fact, um, just a, a quick note, a book that I've been read, I read um, a month ago, uh, written by a moral or a social psychologist who has done a lot of study on morality and the emotions. Um, his name is Jonathan Haidt, and he's written the book, The Religious Mind. He makes a very strong case about how we have an impulse that I would say is our heart and our emotions, and that's what he would say too. That impulse drives our thinking and our choices and our morality, our thinking and our believing. And if unless we really attend to that impulse, we don't even realize that it's really what's driving us in our world and the way that we, we, we respond to our politics and to justice and to people around us. Uh, he just makes a, he's, I would say he's either an atheist or an agnostic at best. And yet he, he would coincide, his, his ideas would coincide what James K. A. Smith is pointing out here. Um, and, and so uh, another author that um, if, you, if you do get a chance to uh, read anything of Smith's, especially his cultural liturgies, you know that he is probably a little bit more academic. If you want to take a step up in academic, you can read Esther Meek's book, Covenantal Epistemology. And um, she really weaves these things together in a, in a really brilliant, and I would say even a poetic form in, in, um, in her understanding of how we are driven by our heart or by something that, that Smith says is a human flourishing, an ideal of living that, um, that gives us what, what scripture calls us the telos. So um, I actually have my notes and I don't have your notes in front of me. So I think the, the next point kind of points to this telos. And the telos, Smith says, is that we are primary teleological creatures, not just creatures of desire, but in our desire, we love a specific vision of the good life, an implicit picture of what we think it means to flourish or to prosper or to, you know, just to put it in layman's terms, to feel good about who we are and about what the world looks like. And that this teleology is what is the end of our love. It was what our love points to. And ultimately, we can have a, a thinking about what the world is, but whatever is shaping our love drives the choices we make and overrides the, the best of ideals, the rules that we have for living in our belief system. Um, and so in reality, uh, if, you, if I could insert Dr. Correll's um, workshop and lecture in this point, he gives a great foundation of how, um, in the first part of his lecture, how liturgy has changed over time and how it's, it went from something that was connected with the way, our way of living, shaping the way we live and the way we think and the way we are, because it was connected to the nature around us and how that's been separated because of several things in history that have, have bifurcated those pieces, separating religion from everyday life, separating values and morality from family and, and um, individualism. Um, he does a great job of exploring those things. And I would say that here in America, um, and, and based on what Jamie Smith says, that we have in America several competing liturgies in our world that work against the, the liturgy of Christian faith, that work against a heart that's, that calls, our, uh, uh, um, calls us to building God's kingdom in this world. And I think in your notes, I put um, Matthew chapter five, verse 48, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That word for perfect is actually the same word, telos, is, a, is the perfect, or the purpose of, of being like God, the purpose of building that human flourishing that God has designed us for and has created us for as humans. And what Jamie Smith says is right now in our current world, across the world, but especially in America, there are several different liturgies that work against the liturgy that uh, um, God would have formed, that God implanted inside of the cycles of 
of the religion of um, Judaism. So without going into those liturgies specifically, let me just identify some of the liturgies that are at work real quickly. The liturgy of the mall. The liturgy of the mall is at work in our world. It values materialism, consumerism. It values like the new next best thing. It values progress. It values, it values efficiency and pragmatism. It values numbers and it defines success in those ways, in those patterns. Um, and I think that probably um, both Dr. Michelle and Dr. Noble have, have built on some of those different um, things in their discussions. Um, Smith identifies a liturgy of the military complex in, in regards to nationalism superseding or, or looking above patriotism. And in the, this military complex, it values a loyalty to nation as equivalent to religion. It values a conformity to how our nation and how our how everybody should look the same and be the same. Um, it, it values power and fear of people who are not like us. Um, that's the kind of the liturgy of the military. Then there's the liturgy of entertainment. Um, in the entertainment system, the there's a, or in the entertainment complex, the, there's a value of freedom of expression, a value of experience and experiential. Um, a value of the personal and immediate gratification, a value of happy over joy, of intimacy as an ultimate end. Um, it values play as profession instead of play as a recreation and a, uh, something that we can enjoy. It, um, we are, in fact, we're having a little discussion with JP about how um, the play has become something we bet on instead of something we enjoy as just recreation as we were talking about gambling and whatnot. So um, there's also a liturgy of technology in our world. And these, these different liturgy, liturgies are working against this teleology. They're, they're reporting or creating a different set of, of values, a different sense of kingdom flourishing than the way we are designed as we understand Christian flourishing and the kingdom of God. And so as these other liturgies are making us the kind of people who desire their kingdoms, the kingdom of the mall, the kingdom of the military, the kingdom of entertainment, and the kingdom of technology, um, even though we may be trying to function in them and thinking about them from a Christian perspective, and that's um, Smith's kind of his his premise behind all of these things. Um, and so this, what we need to understand is that we are, liturgy is not something that is essentially dividing the sacred from the secular any, anymore. Um, based on what Dr. Carell has said, and maybe even Dr. Noble has, has emphasized this, liturgy that used to be something that was ingrained in our everyday life in order to point us to the things that are sacred. Liturgy has become something that is only done in the church and it's only done about a tenth of our, our life experience or is that's the way we've, we've tried to define it. And then we live in this, all of, this whole other kind of liturgy and liturgical life in the world that is actually creating a stronger message and a stronger love inside of us than what the kingdom of God and, and what God is calling us to in loving. Um, and I've, I've got some, yeah, I think I'm going to just jump over that. And so what we need to do is understand how that daily living or what we can do to transform ourselves daily to separate our, our lives from those other liturgies at work. So I'm handing it, going to hand it off to David, and he's going to take it from there. All right, let's see some clap emojis in the chat for the Reverend Brian Kono. That was wonderful and lovely. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Look at that. Claps everywhere. So proud. So this is the point, as Kono had shared. Kono was going to kind of speak and talk using a lot of Jamie Smith's writing to kind of write this 30,000-foot this right kind of vantage point. And this is the point then in the flight where the, the, the uh, seatbelt light is on and we are going to begin our descent now from 
like the the heady, the philosophical world. And we're gonna we're gonna start moving now down to landing on the ground, which in my mind is your own personal life. Like our where do we go from here? Uh, so a guy, it's a similar. Kono leaned a lot on James K. Smith. Uh, I'm going to be leaning a lot on, uh, her name is Tish Harrison Warren. She wrote a book called The Liturgy of the Ordinary. And so this is, uh, whenever you hear me reference or you see in the outline, the name like Warren, that's who I'm referring to, whose writing I'm referring to. So kind of the point I want us to start from in our descent uh, is a quote that uh, from Warren's book where she says, whoever we are, whatever we believe, wherever we live, and whatever our consumer preferences may be, we spend our days doing things. We live in routines formed by habits and practices, and these shape our love, values, and beliefs. So uh, a point I wanna draw on, and I, my notes might be a little jumbled because I added stuff, the Holy Spirit gets in my head and you kind of just start moving stuff around. Um, uh, a point I wanna make that's important for us to consider as we move forward is that no habit or practice is neutral. Everything we do is shaping us in some way or to some end. Now, not everything shapes us to the same degree or that not every practice has the same weight eternally, but everything we do, little decision, big decision, is cultivating or moving us or shaping our love in some direction. And as Kono said also, another thing for us to remember is that our habits and practices shape and reflect what we believe is ultimate or ultimately our view of the good life or what a good life is. So, all right, we're bumping down 200 more feet closer to the earth. So the question that I wanna ask, right, because we're coming at it from this perspective, we're kind of where Kono landed, is that this idea that as believers, as people created in the image of God, we were created loving people, people who basically we worship, right? We love, we worship. Uh, and so the question then is, how does that reality, how do we consider our relationship with God and this that we believe is true about how he created us, how does that influence where we go from here or how we move forward from here? So I've got a couple of verses. You can probably see them on the outline if you're looking at that. I'll read through quickly so we can keep our discussion going. First is Romans 12.2. Uh, it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Next verse is Philippians 4, 8, which says, finally brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And lastly, I want to talk about 2 Peter 1, 5 to 8, which says, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge, knowledge, uh, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So thinking about these verses, right? Some of the things I want to point out is there is uh, scripture would inform us that there are values or beliefs, qualities, habits that are to be desired are things that we as believers are to actively pursue and cultivate, right? So the language we have, do not be conformed but tr be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Uh, in Philippians 4, 8, it says, think about these things. Uh, in 2 Peter, make every effort to add to your faith. Uh, for if you possess these qualities, uh, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive, right? There are, uh, as believers, we have a specific... Oh, did I freeze there? I think I'm back. There's a specific vision of the good life or qualities that we are trying to cultivate, right? As informed by scripture and the Holy Spirit. Um, and so that is what our goal is. So, right, everything is informing us in some way. As believers, as lovers, 
there are certain things that scripture and the Lord and the Holy Spirit and Jesus would encourage us to grow in. So let's talk about habits. Let's talk about practices. Uh, Cause that's ultimately what shapes our love shapes where we're going. So in my notes, uh, if you're following along, I'm actually going to skip over thin and come back to that because I'm going to spend more time talking about that. Um, so I'm going to jump down to thick really quick. So uh, these, this is language from James K. A. Smith, again, that Kono shared. Um, and he would break all habits or practices we have into two main categories, those being thick and thin. So thick categories he would define or describe as habits that play a significant role in shaping our identity and shaping who we are. Uh, examples of this are like participation in a faith community or uh, spending time with the Lord, um, practice of the sacraments, uh, you know, podcasts or books we listen to, educational background, political activism, things that connect us on an identity level to a value, to a community, to a belief, to a way of living. So obviously these things are valuable and you should like, we want, we've, it's good to spend time with the Lord on a daily basis. But again, Cone and I are thinking more about the everyday stuff. So I'll leave you with a couple questions and then I'm gonna jump over to thin. So some things to think about when you look at your life and you think about what are my thick identity forming habits that tie me to community, that tie me to values. Some questions I think that are helpful to think about, and these are all in the outline, are, you know, what authority are you comfortable trusting and submitting to? Um, what teachers, authors, speakers, pastors do you seek out for guidance or insight into theology or current events? What formative practices are you intentional in pursuing? And which ones are you intentional about avoiding or putting off? So those are thick practices. We'll come back to that a little later, but we're gonna go kind of more to the meat of our conversation today, which is thin practices. Uh, so thin practices, uh, and the, the name is a little misleading, but we'll get to that. Um, thin practices, James K. Smith defines as habits that are usually mundane or ordinary. They are not usually pursued for their own sake. Rather, they are an instrument to some other end. So great examples of this are things like brushing your teeth, making your bed, doing laundry, uh, eating or skipping breakfast, washing dishes, driving to work, right? Things that are important or that we do often, but right, are usually more in the, in the pursuit of something else, right? Personal health or hygiene, um, hospitality, right? It's hard to host people if your, your place is a mess, right? Or things we just do for necessity, right? Like you kind of need to do laundry because you need to have clean clothes. I mean, you can go out in dirty clothes, but you might get some funny looks, right? Um, it might affect your ability to be an effective witness for Christ, um, you could say. And so kind of like Kono shared, there's this idea that uh, thin is misleading because it, it kind of comes off with the idea that there is less formation that happens because of these things. And right now, obviously, you know, washing dishes doesn't have the same impact on my identity that spending time with the Lord does or spending time meditating in scripture, but it's still something I do often. And that still shapes my love. It still shapes my everyday practice. And that's what we're talking about, right? The idea that how do we cultivate a sense of liturgy in the everyday? So a more simplified definition or just a rough definition of liturgy I want to offer up is it's ritualized worship, okay? Uh, and again, these thin, these thin habits, uh, they're important because as we said earlier, we recognize that all habits and practices are not neutral. They are still shaping or cultivating something in us. Um, so uh, something I want to read. I want to read a little bit of a section from uh, Warren's book uh, and just an argument she makes. So I'm going to read for a little bit and I, this is kind of going to inform where we're going to go from here. So uh, Tish Warren writes that the crucible of our formation is in the anonymous monotony of our daily rhythms. Read that again. The crucible of our formation is in the anonymous monotony of our daily rhythms. She goes on to write that daily life Dishes in the sink, children that ask the same questions and want the same stories again and again and again. Repetition. And much of the, did I just cut out there for a second? Yeah, you froze. Okay. Uh, so I'll start that little part over again. 
So it says daily life, dishes in the sink, children that ask the same questions and want the same stories again and again and again, the long doldrums of the afternoon, these things are filled with repetition. And much of the Christian life is returning over and over again to the same work and the same habits of worship. We must contend with the same spiritual struggles again and again. The work of repentance and faith is a daily, is daily and repetitive. Again and again, we repent and believe. So just in the same way, right? I think about the average church service, right? There's a liturgy to that. Whether you go to an Orthodox or a Catholic church, or you go to a more non-denominational church, right? Most of us are probably more in that non-denom reign where you show up, and you sing usually three worship songs uh, and there's a little bit of a break for a greeting and then they play an announcement video or someone gives announcements and then the pastor comes up and maybe gives a 20 to, to 40 minute message depending on how charismatic your church is and then it just kind of ends there's usually you know i came from a time where you'd still sang a song at the end of the thing but they don't do that really anymore right um and so but every sunday we do these things right we see these churches are saying that there's value in gathering to worship every week, right? There's value in gathering to open our hearts to experience the presence of God. We believe that there's value in connecting with other believers in a community setting. We believe that there's value in hearing the word of God spoken and the process of working through and submitting our lives to scripture. In the same way, we can form a liturgy in our own daily life. So a question I want to kind of challenge to you, or if there's like something I hope that it's like stick in your jaw, like something gets stuck in your teeth that you think about later tonight or in a couple of days or a couple of weeks is this question I have written out in the notes. Uh, this question is, how am I allowing simple everyday responsibilities and moments to deepen my understanding of love, faithfulness, and faith? How am I allowing simple everyday responsibilities and moments to deepen my understanding of love, faithfulness, and faith. I wanna share two examples that I think are helpful for this. So in her book, Liturgy of the Ordinary, I would say probably anyone who's familiar with the book, uh, probably the most well-known analogy in it is she shares this analogy of making her bed. So this in her life came from a reflection one day of realizing that Every day when she wakes up, the first thing she would do is reach for her smartphone and just start scrolling. You know, Instagram, Facebook, the newest me you know, media or, you know, news, whatever sites, stories, all that stuff. It was this need to be entertained, to be informed, to be connected, to be aware of what's going on. Even though she acknowledged, you know, my friends really haven't posted anything since I last checked at 11 p.m. when I went to bed, right? But there was just this this need, this, it, it cultivated her in this desire for more, for information, for entertainment, to be uh, satisfied with whatever. And she's like, you know, I don't know if that's how I want to start my day. Because she noticed that that desire, that craving would follow her throughout her day. So instead, she chose to challenge herself that when she, when, you know, she set her phone elsewhere, when it went off, she'd shut it off. And then she'd walk over, she'd make her bed, and she'd just sit down for a moment and just say, Lord, I just submit this day to you. I want to be open to ways you want to move in everyday or extraordinary ways. And then she'd get up and she'd go on with getting ready. It's just this, this little habit, right, that ultimately doesn't impact the grain scheme of her life, but it is cultivating, you could say, this little bit of awareness or faithfulness or discipline in her everyday life. Another example I'm going to give from my own personal life. Uh, a thick habit for me that I have been cultivating since my second year in grad school is Sabbath. So that for me is Sundays. Kind of my only, my rule for Sundays is I only do things that give me life. So whether that's, you know, I go to church on Sundays, whether that's playing board games with friends, that's having friends over, that's calling family. In the fall, it's watching, my, watching football, not always my Vikings because sometimes they suck and it's painful. Um, but that's that like that is my thing. So some of the things I don't do are like homework. When I was in grad school, I wouldn't do homework on Sundays. You know, I you know, or nowadays it's a big thing for me is I don't want to do housework on Sundays. So a, a little thin habit I've been trying to cultivate in the last couple months is that I do any cleaning I need to do, I do it on Saturday. 
And so what that's become for me is, you know, making me, not necessarily making me more like Christ, but what I have noticed is that it is a little part of helping to prepare my heart for Sabbath that next day. It's this, you know, I, it only takes me about 30 minutes. I don't have a big apartment. I sweep, sweep the floors. I change my cat's litter box and I vacuum. But then when that's all done, I sit down and it's like this release of, I feel closer to rest. My mind feels more free to think about and look forward to more active space with God on Sunday. Um, so I want to read that question again. So I want to, I want to challenge you with this. I really want to stick this in your spirit. The question is, how am I allowing simple, everyday responsibilities and moments to deepen my understanding of love, faithfulness, and faith? Uh, I want to leave that with you. Now we're going to jump real quick to some, we're going to get even, even closer to the ground. We're almost there. Uh, real quick practical advice, because uh, that's what ultimately Kono and I hope for. Like, yeah, we're, we're talking about a lot of heady things. But ultimately, we want to share things that you can actually take and run with and like apply. So none of this is anything. This is nothing new, crazy, super deep. This is just practical, black and white. What can you do? Uh, so practical advice for reducing a current habit or starting a new one. First thing, start with self-reflection. How do you want to grow? Or how do you want your life to be different? Um, I challenge you with uh, something I heard someone say once a long time ago, it's a chapel speaker. And I was at Taylor. The speaker said, it's only when you're vulnerable that you'll grow. It's only when you acknowledge this is where I'm actually at. This is what I actually need to do to take that next step. Uh, the, the, the quirky church advice I love to give as an example is the, well, just pray and read your Bible. It's like, well, that is so helpful and so not helpful all at the same time. Because I hear that, but what does that even mean, right? Um, so thinking about like, you know, what is something you want to grow in? You know, maybe that's, you know, I want to be more consistent about spending time with the Lord every day. Or, you know, I want to do laundry once a week, not only when I'm basically out of underwear to wear, right? You know, or things like that, right? Like, let's be real, right? Um, so start with self-reflection. What is something or a way you want to grow right now? Next thing is make a plan uh frequency and schedule so like an example i love is running right because most of us either have tried running hate running or now love running there's like no that that's it those are the only categories uh, and if you ever have ever tried to run your lungs have probably screamed like why are we doing this i heard a coach in high school tell me that distance running is the process of convincing your body you aren't actually dying uh and so this is the thing when you think about that or you can apply this to time with the Lord, right? Because spiritual warfare is a thing, right? Uh, if you don't say, okay, this is when I'm going to do it. And this is how often I'm going to do it. It's going to, it's a lot easier to just be like, ah, whatever. I'll just do it tomorrow. Oh, I'll just do it whenever, right? Making a plan sets you up for success. Uh, next thing, invite a friend to participate or practice something with you or invite a mentor to challenge you or keep you accountable or just check in on how you're doing. Pretty straightforward. Nothing crazy there. Uh, last thing, be gracious with yourself. I don't know if that's actually my notes. I think I added that. Um, be gracious with yourself, especially in this season. I don't know about you, but when COVID hit last year, stay at home order hit, when all structure of my life just disappeared, I struggled with that. Like I just like, it was just this free fall of like, what do I do with my day? What do I do with my life? All the structure I relied on is gone. And it's taken a lot of time to like get back into a habit, get back into a rhythm. And you just have to be gracious to yourself. Like give it your best effort each day, be faithful, but recognize you're not perfect. And it's not like you starting a habit is not an unending path of success, like unbroken, right? You're going to have some hiccups. Be gracious, stick with it. Um, practical advice I want to leave you with. Uh, how are we doing on time? This is this till five. We're doing okay, Kona. Okay, cool. Okay, so now the plane is, it wheels are hitting the ground. We are, we are, you have almost arrived. We are gonna pull up in a little bit to the gate, but you're gonna sit on the tarmac for a little bit because that's usually how airports work or big airports that I've flown out of. Um, so I wanna circle back to the, the list you made at the beginning of this, uh, our time together. You kind of wrote out these things on, about what your days looked like. 
maybe you wrote more, more of what your average day looks like. Um, I want to invite you to take a minute and just scan over what you wrote. What are some of the practices? And I, I'd love to kind of see this as being a discussion, right? I, I recognize it's four to five. So this is the end of the day. You're feeling some Zoom fatigue probably. So I want to invite you a chance to engage, participate, take something with you here. Um, you're welcome to just unmute and share a thought if you've got one. But what are some of the practices you see that you are most regularly immersed in? Or what do you think are some of the most significant in ha habits and practices that shape your actions and attitude? What are some thoughts you got? And if I know you, I may call on you, so be careful. Are you saying um, as in relation to what we wrote as like our um, yeah, your, icebreaker? You, yeah, your, your like everyday habits that you wrote earlier, totally. Oh, uh, okay. Um, so like today it was like, I woke up at like seven, drank some water. Uh, I'm a big, I like to hydrate a lot. I feel like that like cures just a lot of things in your body. Uh, just did some like stretching and yoga. And then I like, because today, uh, most days I actually skip breakfast, but today, because no classes, I actually made breakfast. Um, and I'm pretty boring. I just make like just regular oatmeal. But um, and then usually, I don't know if this is a good habit or a bad habit, but I cannot like eat food without watching TV. It's just boring to me. Like, I just can't like, like if I'm, because I don't like have, I don't have like a roommate in my apartment. So it's like, if I'm eating, I'm just eating and just looking at a wall. And it's like, that's kind of boring. So I usually like, uh, I've been watching Modern Family. I don't know if that's good or bad, but whatever. That's what I watch while I eat breakfast. And then I like made uh, like a crock pot meal for like later today. And then just like did some like trash and like sweeping and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then did like a little bit of studying for uh, pharmacology. Shout out Baradovich because that class is really hard. And then uh, pretty much focus from here on out. Yeah. So it sounds like pieces from today that maybe are more usual for you is yeah. like taking care of your body, right? Doing a little bit of stretching, hydrating, doing some studying, right? Especially as a student. I, I mean, I assuming when you say you're cooking, it probably means you had a lower meal plan. So it sounds like cooking. Yeah, I don't have a meal plan. I just, yeah. It's something you do on a daily basis. Yep. Thanks for sharing, JP. Other thoughts? What do you guys see as some of the habits you most often are immersed in on a daily basis? No right or wrong answer. We're just reflecting. KP's looking away from the camera, so don't call on him. That's okay. You know what, just for that, David, I will answer. Wow, my man, my um, dude. <laughs> I don't know, one thing that seems to be really recurring in my life, uh, I tend to wake up a lot earlier than I need to be. Um, like this morning, didn't have to wake up until like 9.30. I woke up at eight. Um, so yeah, I mean, so can you, can you repeat what we are like kind of discussing? Yeah, maybe what do you think are some of the, the practices in your day that you most regularly do in your average week? Like, what do you, what do you see on your day to day that you normally would see on every, on a, a most other days of your week? Yeah. Yeah. Probably that. Uh, I mean, normally just kind of waste some time then never really do anything important, but mm -hmm. it's wake up earlier than I need and just sit there. <laughs> yeah. So the next question I'd like to, to invite you guys to think about is more growth oriented. So, Think about who you want to be both one year and five years from now. What is growth you want to see in your life? And what is a practical way you can start cultivating that? What is like one way you want to grow or something you want to grow in? Something for me that I felt on my heart back in the fall, back in August was I felt the Lord put on my heart to spend more time in silence, which I think might be even more terrifying for some of us than actually the thought of running, right? Of just sitting in, in absolute silence. And I remember starting and I was like, all right, well, I'll, I'll give it five minutes a day. We'll see where this goes. 
And now I probably spend about 30 minutes a day just sitting in silence and listening for the Lord. And it's kind of like, huh, it's kind of, I didn't notice that. Wow, I spent a lot more time doing this than I thought I ever would. Because right, you start doing something and you get in the habit of it and it becomes more comfortable and you actually kind of begin to enjoy it, right? You can enjoy running. You can enjoy silence. Random thought. What are you guys? What is something you want to grow in? Uh, trying to like learn to balance the um, like passion for things versus like um, things that are actually not necessarily that you're not necessarily that passionate about, but that kind of need to be done regardless. Because like it's easy to spend a lot of time doing something you're passionate on. Like like for me, like anything. Like if any of my homies call me up and are like, Hey, like, like pack your bags. We're going to Kentucky or we're going to Tennessee. Let's go climbing. Like I'm hopping in that sprint or U-Haul or whatever, you know, and I'm, I'm there kind of thing. And I have no qualms making that sacrifice. But sometimes though, like being an adult means you gotta be like, nah, man, I got to test Monday. I can't, I can't do that. And so like, it's like, it's like climbing isn't bad or like, you know, pursuing outdoor recreation isn't bad but like it can be negative in the sense that like if you're doing that at the abandonment of like other more important things like professionally developing yourself or whatnot it could be a bad thing if that makes sense so like I guess not being just purely driven by like things that you're passionate about and I mean, I suppose the most ideal situation is the thing that you're passionate about is the professional thing that you pursue as well. But like, we're not all that lucky, I guess. I don't know if that makes sense or not. JP, you just identified like one of the things that David and I had hoped we all might learn from this is that uh, the, the things that we do in our day, we have to attend to wh what value they have in our lives and try to create liturgies, habits, and practices that continue to point to what would be human flourishing, especially as believers uh, flourishing at, and uh, building into the kingdom of God. Because it's so easy to get distracted and drawn, you know, with things that we do really love to do. You know, I, I love to run, bike, and swim. And I could there was a, a season a few years back where I was doing that three to four hours a day. And um, there was a point where my wife looked at me and she said, I appreciate that you want to be healthy because I know that probably part of that is that, that we'll live long lives together. But sometimes I feel like you're doing that at the detriment of spending time with me. And I had to take that to heart, like, okay, how is this value, this practice, this habit, which I think is, it was a, a, you know, potentially healthy habit, probably a little bit obsessive habit. How do I bring that back and value my relationship with my wife and, um, and, and continue also to value um, being healthy. So thanks for pointing that out, JP. That's a, a good measure i think that is really the point of understanding liturgies and, and understanding the values that are behind them cool well Kono, do we want to share some of the the resources we kind of have compiled just to help students also get some practical ideas yeah go ahead and do that i'm actually going to reshare our link because there's a couple things that I, we had just a little bit uh, we had identified a book that was not the right title for the book and so okay. it's been added. So in fact, I'll just share just that section and I'll put it in the, maybe put it in the chat instead of sharing the whole link again. That's great. Yeah, I can jump in and just start sharing yeah, something. Do it. So uh, obviously one of the books, so we're gonna share some resources that we think if you're like, hey, if there's something you wanna learn more about or you wanna do some more reading on some of the stuff we shared about, here's some great resources that we think would be helpful in you starting that. Uh, first one, obviously, Literature Ordinary is the, the book I shared about, all about uh, finding uh, sacred practices in everyday life. Solid book. 
Uh, there's another book I have called uh, The Deeply Formed Life by a pastor called Rich Viadas. He just released this in November. Um, but he kind of talks about five values uh, that root us in the way of Jesus. So some of those are contemplative life, justice, sexuality, um, missional living. Um, so if you're looking for, it's a great combination of like th theoretical and practical, like, okay, this is what we should believe, but how do I do this? Um, obviously, and Kona may share more, Desiring the Kingdom, solid book, great guy, J.K. Smith, sweet dude. Uh, another little book, and if you want, you can just look these up, they're on the list. Which is just a little short book about uh, learning to invite God or to see God more in just the every little day parts of your life. Trying to let God into more of your life than just your Bible time or your Devo time. That's not on the list, is it, Brian? No, I'm it's not on the list. That's Practicing the Presence by Brother practicing Lawrence. Practicing the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. Yeah. So those are some of the resources I have to share. Kono's got some more if you're interested. And again, it's in the outline, so you can look these up if you want. I'm just writing that one in quick. I think I got that spelled correctly. Yeah, I, if you like the Desiring the Kingdom book is quite academic. And he, he when Smith originally wrote it, he was like, I'm going to write this book and make it accessible for the layperson. And then he wrote more notes in the book than there is content in the book. So it's a, it's a pretty heady book. Instead, his book, You Are What You Love, The Spiritual Power of Habit is a much easier book to read and kind of delves into these same issues uh, pretty quickly. I would say um, something that's been an encouragement to me, Mudhouse Sabbath is written by Lauren Winner. And it's a, a book that looks at some everyday practices. Lauren Winner is a, a, like a Messianic Jew. She grew up in a Jewish family, but is a Christian now. And she has incorporated some of the the Jewish practices into her daily living because the Jewish practices are so rich in pointing out the sacred in the, the, like the daily habit of life. So it's a really accessible, really short book. Um, she actually, one of the things I took out of, uh, I've took away from there is a candle light. My father-in-law passed away. My father-in-law was very important to me, a hero of mine and for our family as well. And so we, there's a, a practice of honoring a, a person who's passed on that, that she uses and suggests that comes out of the, out of uh, the Judaistic uh, culture that we've practiced and continue to practice. So um, that book, and then The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer. He's a pastor out west great he's got some great podcasts a little bit his podcasts are his his messages his preaching is is usually an hour long maybe even longer than that so if you really like long podcasts he'd be the guy to, to download um his church is called oh grief somebody know help can help me a uh, brit oh i'm sorry just look up John Mark Comer and you can find, do a Google search. The website, practicingtheway.org is a, a, like a sub website from his church, Bridgetown, thank you, Corey, um, is a, a, a way of cultivating seven practices of Jesus into your life. Um, and it, the, the practicingtheway.org is actually part of a, podcast series that he put together a sermon series he put together and um if you want to really cultivate your faith in a very directional and very intentional way it'd be something to to explore and i'd be happy to walk through that with you if you'd like um yeah so those are some resources we have and probably there, there are a bunch more but um that'll be a good start for you can't quite hear you, Amanda. Oh, can you hear me now? My computer's weird. Thank you so much, Brian and David. Um, there are so many just tangible takeaways from that. Um, so really appreciate it. I just bought the Liturgy of the Ordinary, so I'm really excited to read that mm. myself. So thank you everyone for attending today. Um, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you.
Bye, everyone.